Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Honda K-Series engine and just what makes them so popular. Now here I've got a K20A3 engine from an Acura RSX. Now while these engines are known to be pretty reliable, they also rev really high which makes them fun to drive. They also respond very well to bolt-on modifications which makes them a magnet for racers and enthusiasts alike. Taking a look around this engine here, we've got a metal valve cover, metal intake runners but it does have a plastic manifold that bolts up to it, aluminum block and a stamped steel oil pan at least on this version at the back here we've got the coolant inlet and down here we have the thermostat just behind the water pump and the k-series replaced the b-series which actually used to sit backwards and spin counterclockwise this one sits traditionally clockwise in the engine bay over on this side here we have the VTEC solenoid now this has the economy version of VTEC because it's the a3 and at the bottom here we have the oil filter and the exhaust or turbocharger would bolt up over here now we're not expecting to see any cartridge today because this was a running engine so let's take this apart and see how it works pop off this cover here the ignition coils are missing pop off these valve cover bolts there's the valve cover this was a low mileage engine that came out of a wrecked car and it really does show it's pretty clean in here taking a look under the valve cover here you can see this uses a roller rocker arm design here where the camshaft is going to press down on the roller which in turn is going to press down on the valve this is definitely a more complicated setup especially for an economy minded engine now here's where we come to the controversy of Honda's IV tech system now in this case here you have a lobe which is going to control this valve over here and then on this side you don't really have much of a lobe here so this valve is almost remaining shut now when you hit the middle RP say around two or three thousand the VTEC switch at the back here is going to send oil pressure to lock up these two rockers over here and both of these valves are going to follow the higher cam profile now previously VTEC used to have a larger cam lobe over here that you'd have a distinctive transfer of airflow once you lock up all these cams to open these valves up even further also on this engine the intake is the only one with VTEC the exhaust is just a single lobe controlling two of those valves now in addition to VTEC we've got variable valve timing which is controlled through this oil control valve now everybody knows that the crank bolts on Hondas are super tight so I'm gonna have to spin the engine over and lock the crankshaft in order to get that out before I can get the timing cover now before I do that let's see if we can get the cam rocker arm system off first we're gonna knock the cam bolts loose next I'm gonna remove all the cam caps take off these bolts here see if we can get this off the timing tension there we go here's the camshaft and the exhaust camshaft there's a secret hex here try up here Let's remove some of these accessories. Tensioner pulley. Next I'm gonna remove the water pump. That water pump's just the perfect size and shape. Engine mount. Gotta break these free first, they're a little tight. This here's where your lower radiator hose will hook up to. It's actually a plastic housing and a plastic body for the thermostat. Now the housing bolts up to this piece over here that houses the water pump. It's got a soft line and a hard line over here, so let's see if I can get that off. There's actually more 12s on this engine than 10s. We can get this off here. This is a bad design in my opinion. I don't know why you'd need a hard line here just for the heater hoses. There we go, it's got an O-ring on here as well. Now I can remove this big bracket that holds the water pump and thermostat. All right, so it looks like we got a bit of an oil separator inside of here from the crankcase down there all the way to the top here where it leads to this port. And I'm assuming this is gonna to lead to the throttle body to gum up your intake. Additionally, we have a thermostat that lives in here and that's gonna pass coolant to the water pump, which is gonna pump it, send it down over here, straight into the block. And just remove this bracket for the AC compressor. Super design, you can't get a socket on this intake over here, so you actually have to use a wrench. Knock this guy off here. You really start to appreciate power tools when you haven't used them for a while. And sit here and just loosen this thing off. Take off the rest of the bolts. Pop this off here. Now one thing with most K-Series engines, except the newer K20C, is that they're port injected. So the fuel actually gets injected into the airstream over here before it goes down into the engine. And if I take my wife's toothbrush, you can see how gummed up that is. Alright, here we've got the coolant outlet. This is where the coolant temperature sensor lives up inside of here. Just gonna pull off these bracketry here. All right, wish me luck as I try to drain this engine. Whoa, it's full. Of course I always get these engines when it's full. All right, wish me luck as we try to turn this engine over to work on the bottom. Oh, there's a lot of oil in there. Now at the bottom of this K-Series engine, we have a stamped steel oil pan. Now some Hondas are known for using a cast aluminum oil pan. Now these bolts are really rusty, so I'm just gonna have to brush them and hopefully they don't strip out. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and remove all these fasteners. All right, see if we can get this off. 
It definitely looks like that oil pan has been resealed because it was really difficult to get off. Now one difference between the K24 and this K20 here is that there's an entire balance shaft assembly on the K24 being a little bit heavier. It produces a little bit more vibration and that's supposed to cancel it out. This one here just has a single oil pump driven off of the timing chain over here. Now some people who are rebuilding these motors will just get rid of that balance shaft assembly altogether and switch over to this style of oil pump. Alright, I'm going to remove this windage tray. This just helps oil to collect at the bottom so that it can get picked up by this. Now despite this being a quote unquote low mileage engine, I do notice there's a bit of fragment sitting up around this oil pump here. There's a little bit more of that stuff over here too. I'm going to work on removing this oil pump. First I'm going to remove this guide over here. And that chain becomes looser. These guys are pulling a German. There's two 12s and a 10 holding the same oil pump on. Could be the same socket. Here we go, the oil pump. All right, the time has come to bust this bolt free. Got something wedged in here. All right, I got it wedged under the gate there. Good. All right, we're gonna remove this. There's not even a Loctite on there. Dig this out. All right, at least it's not press fit. Apologize for all the noise my neighbor's still making their house two years later. So it's been three and a half weeks since I removed the crank pulley and I renovated my entire basement. Next thing I'm gonna do is remove this timing cover. A bunch of 10 mils going all the way around. I'm going to remove the variable cam timing oil control valve here. These usually get pretty stuck in there. There we go. Now right, I'm going to pry this timing cover off. Whoa, that was violent. Now you can see here we've got a little access port to access the timing chain tensioner in case it does fail. It's easy to swap out. And we've also got the crank position sensor which is externally accessible. And that's it. It's a pretty simple timing cover. There's no oil galleys running through here that could leak. Alright, so here we've got the timing chain. I'm going to remove the tensioner next. Gotta remove the chain guides. Now the backing for the chain guides are actually a die cast metal, whereas the slides themselves are made of plastic. At least the whole thing's not made of plastic. Gotta remove this hex here next. This is the other chain guide. This is also a die cast metal. And this is where the tensioner butts up to. Got a little piece of steel here so it doesn't wear through. Gotta remove this bolt. And now I can remove the large timing chain. It's actually a pretty thin chain, not too chunky at all. And we have this plastic cover here. This is the oil pump drive here. There's actually splines on the inside here, but there's no splines here. It's not keyed or anything. Remove this guide for the oil pump. Now this is made of full plastic, but it's not like the oil pump is vital to the engine, right? Now here we come to the high maintenance item on all K-Series engines, and that's this VTEC solenoid. Now this VTEC solenoid sometimes might stop working and give you VTEC codes, but moreover, the gasket inside of here between the head always tends to leak, like always. And when it leaks, it's on the exhaust side, it drips down on the exhaust, and you think your oil filter is actually leaking, but it's not. And getting to this is a little bit tricky because it's at the back of the firewall. A bunch of 10 millimeter bolts. Hopefully they don't rust out on me. Got a 9 mil whacked on here, let's see if we can crack it loose. No. Alright, I got it. And here's the infamous VTEC solenoid. And this gasket that all dealerships know the part number by head when you go to order it. Alright, the head bolts on these are 12.14 mil. I'm gonna zip these bolts off. Now for a mid mile engine, the piston tops don't look too bad. They're not super clean though, so definitely a used engine. And I'm glad to see it has blue coolant inside, which is the Honda specific one. Now we'll turn it over and work on this side. Now one thing that makes this engine so strong is that instead of using semicircular caps for each main bearing, they use this ladder frame design, which is bolted to the block on the top and bottom sides over here. And it kind of makes everything strong as one single piece as opposed to having singular caps. And that forms the upper oil pan or the lower part of the block. Now I'm going to remove all the 12 mils that go around here and hold this to the block. Now let's see if my impact can actually whip these guys off. These are 14 mil main cap bolts. Here's the upper oil pan. It's more like a lower block. This thing is really hefty. All right, next I'm going to remove these connecting rods. These are a 12.10 millimeter bolt. We'll just pop this guy out of here. This whole crankshaft wants to come out. Let's push this one through as well. Let's take out these middle two. Now for a mid-mileage engine, the coating here is actually worn through. They don't look perfect at all, but there definitely hasn't been any debris or anything run through the oil system. So this was a good engine. Pull off the rear main. This is a garter spring. Very simple design. Now I'm going to remove the crankshaft. 
Oh, this is a hefty one. This is what makes a K series a K series. Just for a little two liter four cylinder engine. Damn. Finally, I'll remove the engine from the stand. Bro, even this is lighter than the crankshaft. Look at this. So now that we've taken this thing apart, let's take a closer look at some of the components. And we're gonna start here at the bottom of the engine where we've got the oil pump. This one here is made by Yamada. Now on other K24 engines, the oil pump's integrated with a balance shaft assembly. And that's because those engines are a little bigger. They create a little bit more vibration, so it makes them a little smoother. And the vehicles that they go in are a little bit more refined. Things like the Honda Accord and CRV. Now as for this K20 out of an RSX, it's a little smaller engine. It can do with more vibrations. Most people tend to remove the balance shafts anyways when they're tuning this engine for a little bit less reciprocating mass and you can add more oil to the sump. Now as for this oil pump let's take it apart. Let's take a look inside. All right we just have a gear style oil pump and on the outside of that we have the outside gear piece and it goes in like that. All right so how this works is we've got the oil pump which is going to be rotating with the timing of the engine. The oil is going to be coming in from this side over here and it's going to be forced through these little gears over here and as it spins it's going to create oil flow and then that's going to be pumped out to the block over here. And like all pumps you have an oil bypass valve if the pressure builds up too fast if your rpms are too high the spring-loaded bypass valve is going to open and bring that oil back over on this side essentially creating a short circuit. There's no variable oil pump here it's all mechanical. We've got a long tube that goes down to the screen which is squeaky clean as expected. The oil from the pump is then going to be sent through this lower portion of the block straight into the main engine block down here. That oil is then going to be sent into the block straight over to the oil filter where it's going to get filtered out and then make a sharp 90 degree turn to go instead this way through a galley that runs through the length of the block. Over here we've got our oil pressure switch and the block cooler. You'll note that there is no oil cooler on this guy. Now one thing that's also missing is oil squirters. Now that oil galley runs along the length of the block and you can see for each piston here, it looks like they've casted holes where you could tap into to get oil squirters to lubricate the pistons. And the main bearings also tap into that oil feed to lubricate the crankshaft and connecting rod. You can see at the back of that oil galley the giant hexagon plug they've put here. So in case you do have any oiling issues and you're rebuilding the engine, it's easy to just zip this out and clean things out. Now looking at the K20's deck at the top here, you'll see that these cylinders are very simple, nice open deck design. However, if you are going to be pushing more than 300, 400 horsepower, that open deck design could work against you because these walls would just blow right out. The cooling system is also very simple and straightforward on this K20. Essentially, you've got this water pump assembly with the thermostat. It's bringing in coolant straight directly into cylinder number one's jacket, where it's going to flow that way out through the top of the rear of the head. Now one thing I don't like about the cooling system is that it does use a plastic thermostat housing which of course could crack and leak over time but I'm sure this being a K-series someone's made a metal version of this out there somewhere in this world. Now in terms of the condition of this engine it's actually pretty good you could still see some of the cross hatching here. This rust ring here was probably because it was sitting for a little while while I was doing my renovations but other than that the inside of this block looks pretty good. Taking a look at these pistons here now this is a mid mileage engine I did notice some of the oil control rings are getting a little bit on the clogged side but overall they are pretty clear and I don't think this engine was burning too much oil. The K-series isn't really really known to be too much of an oil burner especially if you compare it to a Toyota from this vintage. Now the piston tops here have these little divots for the valves but it's also got this bowl here so that it accelerates the explosion when the spark plug fires. Now these little channels over here is going to take some of that oil from this connecting rod bearing area and spray it up into the cylinders as opposed to using separate sprayers. Now one difference between the K20 and K24 is that this K20 uses a square design which means that the diameter here is the same as the stroke whereas on a K20 they've stroked it out to be a little bit longer to give you that extra displacement but that also increases the blocks deck height. Now having that smaller reciprocating mass means you can rev this out a little bit more but having that longer stroke in the K24 will give you more low end torque for day to day use. These pistons are in beautiful condition and they feel pretty hefty for an economical car. Here we come to the engine head which is where a lot of these K-series engines vary. Let's just take a look at the bottom here at the condition. You'll see that this one here is again normal mid mileage engine. We got a bit of crust on this valve over here. Let's take a look at this head gasket. Everything looks pretty intact. Very simple multi-layer steel gasket. Now looking underneath the head here you'll see the coolant is going to flow through the outside here to the outlet at the back of the head. You've also got the oil feed here for the VTEC system which sits over here. Now different K-series heads are going to give you different airflow with the way these are machined. Here you can see where that oil comes up. The VTEC solenoid sits at the back here and the VTC solenoid for the intake side sits over here. That oil travels through this galley and then out to the front here. Now the front here you just have a cap that you can unbolt and pretty much run something through here. How the VTEC system works is you've got that fluid pressure which is going to be switched on by the spool valve that's going to send oil pressure down through this hole over here across the head bolt hole 
and then into this hole here where it's going to feed the rocker assembly. Meanwhile, at the side of the head, you got your typical oil control valve, which is going to control the amount of oil to apply or release through these holes over here that go to the intake cam gear. I do have another video on how that variable valve timing system works, so you might want to check that out. But this is essentially a cam phaser where the camshafts themselves are going to be differently clocked than the input which is coming from the chain. I've got another video on how VTEC works, but let's take a quick look at how it works here. First of all, the exhaust side, at least on this engine, does not have VTEC. And that single lobe is going to be pressing down on this single rocker over here. And that in turn is going to move up and down to close and open the exhaust valves together. There's no difference between either side. Now when you come to the intake side, things are a little different. You can see here, this one's got a normally large shaped lobe. And then there's a smaller lobe, but this lobe is actually timed slightly off. Now you got two different cam profiles over here and they're also timed differently. Now on the rocker arm assembly you have two different rollers and they can pivot independently of each other just like that. However when VTEC kicks in yo, we have oil pressure going to be sent down through this rocker arm assembly to this little pin over here and that is going to lock these rockers together so they move up and down at the same pace. Now because you have low and high well the rocker arms are just going to follow the high and then both of the valves are going to be opened up to the same amount at, at the same degree. And that's why they call this the economy version of VTEC essentially you've got one low and one high and then when you engage VTEC they're both high now in the more serious performance oriented versions of these heads you've got three lobes the two of them are operating at the same time and when you lock on to the middle lobe well that's when you really kick in VTEC and it's got an extra height to it to open those valves a lot more and that's when the engine starts screaming after like four or five thousand rpm now this system's proven to be reliable although it is a little more mechanically complex and it's very sensitive to oil pressure of course when you increase the stroke of these intake valve a lot of air is going to start rushing in there to give you more combustion and because it's just a simple changeover from low to high you hear that audible changeover in the intake induction system especially when the engine goes from to as I've mentioned before, this spool valve likes to leak, but this gasket's actually got a little screen on there, and when it starts to build up with particles from inside your oiling system, it doesn't really function that well, and that's when you start getting VTEC code. And that's a wrap on the Honda K20 engine and how it works. Now, if you are looking to get a car or this engine, get it now, because it's super cheap. You can probably find them in the junkyard real easy, and they have a huge aftermarket support. Not only that, these are very reliable engines. I just wish that Honda transmissions would be just as reliable. If you can find one with a manual, Manual transmission however it'll probably die of rust or wrapping it around a tree before anything else now make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one